And as this is going on, Dmitri comes into the room and somehow he gets the Poles to go away because he gives them money to go away. He then orders a tremendous amount of food and drink and they get together to have a real Russian banquet in the countryside. And Dostoevsky goes to town in describing what a real Russian debauch, what a real Russian banquet is with gypsy dancers, with sweets, with all kinds of wines, with vodka, with the finest kind of food. Dmitri seems to spend his last kopeck in order to bring off this tremendous banquet and impress Grushenka. And just as in the scene with Alyosha, Grushenka turned from a rather nasty seducer into a very understanding person who understands what love is, so with, with Dmitri in the scene, she, she begins to understand that she's made a big mistake in going for this Polish lover, that Dmitri, a Karamazov, a Russian, is a person of deep feeling, a deep understanding, that she could be together with him in a very good way. And she, she gets the idea that she will eventually become the wife of Dmitri. As a matter of fact, at one point he wants to, to sleep together with her. She says, no, 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 let's wait. Let's do it in the right way. Let's wait until we get married. And as they sort of doze off in the room, they hear the sounds of the banquet, they hear the celebration that's going on next door, and through the sleep and the dreams of Dmitri, you suddenly hear bells. Dmitri is dreaming of bells that are going on, and of course he suddenly wakes up to realize that, as a matter of fact, there are real bells. A police troika, a police carriage has come to investigate him, and of course there are bells on any good troika in those days. And suddenly, from having experienced the warmth and the wonder of being with Grushenka, Dmitri is plunged into the hell of a police interrogation because the prosecutor, Ipolit Kirillovich, who doesn't like Dmitri anyway, is deeply convinced that Dmitri has murdered his own father. And as they go through that investigation, you realize that circumstances are piling up in a way that people really are going to believe. There's really going to be very, very good proof that Dmitri did committed that murder, because the question is, where did he get that money? The money, of course, uh, had been waiting with the old man for, for Grushin to come, and whoever murdered him obviously took the money. Uh, this goes on and on through many, many different uh, circumstances. They remember that Dmitri has, uh, had threatened once upon a time that he would kill the old man, that he had beaten the old man, beaten to the extent that the old fellow was bloody. Uh, it looked very bad for Dmitri. And at a certain point, they said, now you have to undress. He says, look, why do I have to undress? He says, that's part of the investigation. We have to see you completely without clothes on. And of course, Dmitri has a, a toe of which he's somewhat ashamed. This is a somewhat misshapen toe, and that toe is exposed. And suddenly, we get a replay here of the exposure of the unadorned self that I talked about earlier in Poor Folk. And you also here get a, a something of a reprise of a play that Dostoevsky really admired, King Lear. You remember where King Lear is suddenly stripped to the, to the bone uh, strips to so he has no clothes on and the heath in the middle of a terrible storm. The idea being that only uh, when one is completely unprotected by clothes does one get to the real person and Dmitri is now subjected to that terribly painful test. Well, uh, it's clear that they have uh, reason to arrest Dmitri. Uh, he is forced to go with them and uh, it soon becomes clear to all the townspeople there's going to be a trial that's going to try Dmitri for the murder of his own father. Meanwhile, we then go back to the other brother, that is Ivan, the intellectual brother. Now Ivan is beginning to feel a terrible sense of guilt for the murder of his father because, because of course, it is he who has preached to the world that there is no God. And if there is no God, then everything is allowed. And of course, this has been, been particularly picked up by his half-brother, uh, uh, Smirjakov, uh, who is most uh, uh, strongly attracted to this kind of teaching that, well, if there is no God, then I'm free to do anything that I want to uh, in this world. Ivan is beginning to feel more and more that he too is guilty of the murder of his father, even though obviously he didn't commit the actual murder. And of course it's rather interesting that Sigmund Freud, in his development of the idea of the Oedipal Complex, wrote an essay where he, th he said, there are three great examples in history, in the history of literature, of parasites. He talks about uh, Oedipus of Sophocles. He talks about Hamlet uh, of Shakespeare. And he talks about the brothers Karamazov of Dostoevsky, putting them all in this category. I'm not trying to make an argument here for Freud's theory, but it's interesting that a superior intellect like that of Freud would see these three works of literature as uh, 
somehow connected with each other thematically, and of course obviously connected with this whole idea of the Oedipus complex, where the son has both love and hatred toward the father, and sometimes is capable even of the killing of the father. Ivan is going through this. Uh, while he's going through this, he decides to go to see Smirjakov, his half-brother. Smirjakov, who had earlier been a tremendous admirer of Ivan, now looks at him with a certain considerable distaste, almost a kind of intellectual condescension. Yes, it was you who got me to this state, and look where I am. Look the kind of fix I'm in. I'm sick, and nobody wants to have anything to do with me. As a matter of fact, in three interviews with Smirjakov, in one of these interviews, Smirjakov tells you that it was he that murdered the old man. He even shows him the rubles that he took from the time when he committed the murder. Ivan understands that his brother Dmitri is being unrightfully accused of a murder. He resolves that he's going to try and help his brother. But as he has these interviews with Smirjakov, he feels more and more badly about what he's done. He gets an increasingly sick, almost insane state of mind. As he goes back to his room, planning what he's, going to, what he's going to do, suddenly another presence is in the room. When he looks more carefully, I remember that scene with Friedrich Eilov in Crime and Punishment. Here he sees somebody dressed as a Russian gentleman, very well dressed. As this person begins to talk with him more and more, he suddenly understands who this person is. It's the devil himself who's come to visit Ivan, who's come to torture Ivan. You get a marvelous, half-ironic, half-comic, half-horrible scene, three halves there, of an interview between Ivan and the devil. It's interesting, in this particular scene, the very first Sputnik, that is, the very first artificial satellite in the world, in imagination, of course, is sent into the heavens. The devil talks about ethereal spaces, a place where it can be 150 degrees below zero, and tells Ivan of a game village girls play, where they convince a peasant to put his tongue to an axe when it's very, very cold. Only 30 degrees below zero, but still very, very cold. Of course, the tongue sticks to the axe. The peasant has to tear the axe off, it being very painful. Ivan says, well, what happens to the axe? Can there be an axe there? Ivan's talking about the ethereal world of 150 degrees below zero. The devil says, well, it would begin flying around the earth like a satellite, like a Sputnik. It rises and falls like an artificial satellite in the sky. So you can say it was Dostoevsky who launched the first cosmic satellite. The devil also talks about the Russian atheist who denies the existence of God, who denies the existence of an afterlife, and denies the existence of paradise. He suddenly dies and wakes up to find himself an afterlife. He thinks it's a terrible scandal. This place doesn't exist. He lies to the ground and pounds and pounds on the ground. No, it can't be here. This place doesn't exist. He does this for several eons. Suddenly it hits him. There really is a paradise. He walks millions of miles in order to get to paradise and becomes such an enthusiastic preacher of God in paradise that the people who are there won't even let him shake hands with him. The devil said, <laughs> you Russians, you always go to extremes. Then the devil brings up the Grand Inquisitor. He obviously knows what's on Ivan's mind. Ivan says, don't you dare bring up the tale of the Grand Inquisitor. The devil says, oh no, that was quite a good story you told there. As the conversation goes on, Ivan picks up a glass and throws it at the devil. The devil jumps up. Ivan has obviously remembered Martin Luther, who threw an inkstand at the devil. Suddenly there is a knocking at the window. The devil disappears. Ivan finds that Alyosha has come to tell him that Smirjakov has committed suicide. Smirjakov has hung himself. Ivan realizes it's up to him to save his brother Dmitri from the false accusation of parricide. Then, near the end of the novel, we have the scene of what Dostoevsky calls a judicial error, a trial that takes place where the verdict really is an error. It's the trial of Dmitri. The curiosity of the whole town has been aroused. All the women of the town are tremendously on the side of Dmitri. They find him a very attractive, romantic figure. All the men of the town are very jealous of Dmitri and want to see him convicted. Dmitri has a defender with a Polish name, an attorney from Petersburg who has come to defend him in this very prominent trial. Uh, he'll get a very tremendous advantage from his name being known throughout the country. At that time, there had been some legal reforms in Russia, a system they'd been working on for 20 or 30 years was being put into effect. This was during the reign of Alexander II, one of the most liberal of all the Tsars. The idea was to bring Russian law more connected with Western ideas of jurisprudence, the Napoleonic Code, the idea that a person was innocent until proven guilty. 
the idea there would be a defense lawyer who wouldn't have to believe in the innocence or guilt of his client, but simply make the best argument he possibly could for the client. There would be a prosecuting attorney who would make the best argument he could possibly could make. Then it would be up to a jury to sift out evidence and a judge who would see to it that things were done according to the law. Now, this is a system that anyone living in America understands very well. Uh, this was something new in Russia. And, of course, Dostoevsky is giving his own take on this reform and this new system in the course of the novel. Now, Fichukovich, the defense attorney, is obviously convinced that Dmitry really did kill the old man. He's quite cynical. And so what he does is to make an argument, then make the very best argument for something which he believes uh, is false. That is to say, he's trying to make the very best argument he can for Dmitri's innocence, although he doesn't really believe in Dmitri's innocence. And what he manages to do is to make an absolute monkey out of every witness that the prosecution calls. When the old servant who's been so kind to, to Dmitri comes and is absolutely convinced that nevertheless Dmitri did the murder, Fichukovich asks him, what year is this? And of course, the old man, does, he's a peasant, he does, he's illiterate, he doesn't know, he says, your honor is wont to make fun of me. And, of course, everybody laughs, and he goes, this, this happens with witness after witness. Fichukovich shows that what they say makes no sense whatsoever. The prosecutor, Ippolit Kirillovich, uh, hates Dmitri and is deeply convinced that Dmitri really is guilty, and he argues passionately for what he believes is the truth to show that Dmitri is guilty. But, of course, he's very frustrated by the skill of Fichukovich, the, the, the defender, because Fichukovich keep, keeps making mincemeat out of every one of his witnesses. But at the final moment, Katerina Ivanovna, one of the infernal women who is terribly angry at Dmitri because she knows he wants to go off with Grushenka and has the jealousy of a woman scorned, suddenly gets up in the courtroom and produces a letter that Dmitri has written to her. And in this letter, he talks passionately about how he hates his father, wishes him dead, and will plan the murder of his father. And of course, that tips the balance. That eventually causes the, the convicting of Dmitri for a crime he didn't commit. Now, what's interesting is that Fyachukovich, who is absolutely cynical and who doesn't believe the arguments he's making, is actually arguing for what we, the readers, know is the truth. We know that Dmitri did not murder the old man, that it was, as a matter of fact, it was Smirjakov. But here is Fyachukovich, the cynic, arguing for the truth. Whereas Ippolit Kirillovich, who is deeply, con sincerely convinced that Dmitri is wrong, is, is guilty, is actually arguing for something that's false. The, the cynic uh, is somehow leading to truth, and the sincere man is actually leading to an unjust uh, uh, verdict. With this irony, I think, Dostoevsky is trying to give his own opinion about the notion of human justice, because, of course, what he believes is that human beings can't judge other human beings. But the novel ends uh, with a sermon by Ayosha at a stone, at the, at the grave of a young man who has died, Ilyusha, a young man. And as Ayosha is preaching the sermon to young boys, whom he obviously is going to bring up in a much better way than the Karamazovs have been brought up. Uh, part of the novel is about how young people are brought up. Dostoevsky says, the same Dostoevsky has so many heavy things to the novel very likely in one phrase thrown away that you can miss very easily when you read the book. He says, strange to say, the body of the young boy didn't smell. You remember the contrast, of course, with Zasima. Well, after all, it was natural. This was a young boy cut off like a young flower. Zasima was an old man cut off uh, in, the, in, in summertime. This is wintertime. There are all kinds of natural reasons why it wouldn't smell, and yet he didn't smell. And, of course, the implication is that resurrection will, after all, have taken place. That that seed of wheat, which was in the earth, will give forth fruit if it dies. And, of course, the legacy that Dostoevsky left with this novel and all the other novels is a very, very powerful legacy.